Once a car goes out of control and starts to crash, your fate is determined largely by physics. In this video, we'll investigate the relationship between stopping distance and average force, and how speed affects the kinetic energy of a vehicle. How does an egg carton stop eggs from breaking? Why do you bend your knees when landing from a jump? What principles of physics help us to explain what we see here? A car acts like the cardboard box. When the car crashes, it's better for the car to crumple than the people inside it. What causes the difference in force between smashing into a wall and controlled braking? The difference is related to the stopping distance. We can test this by varying the stopping distance and measuring the average force on an object in the car. To do this, we've placed a 40 kilogram sandbag on a trolley. Against the cargo restraint are some bathroom scales. When the car brakes, the sandbag will slide forward and push against the scales, showing us the average force on the sandbag. This can be directly read from the scales and is measured in kilograms force. As you physics buffs know, multiply this by 9.8 to get newtons, the standard measurement of force. Remember that forces come in pairs. The sandbag acts on the scales and the scales act on the sandbag. The pair of forces are equal in size but act in opposite directions. In this case we'll concentrate on the force on the sandbag. We'll do a series of tests in which the speed remains constant but the stopping distance varies. In each case the driver will brake evenly using the same braking force from a speed of 50 kilometers per hour. We'll repeat this over three different distances, measuring the average force on the sandbag. When the car stops over a distance of 40 metres, the average stopping force is 10 kilograms force. Now let's stop in 20 metres, half the distance. The average stopping force is doubled to 20 kilograms force. Now let's stop in half the distance again. The minimum distance you can stop in at this speed is 12 metres and the average force is 33 kilograms force. If a vehicle was stopped in 5 metres, the average force would be 80 kilograms force. And if it was stopped in 2.5 metres, the average force would be 160 kilograms force. This graph tells us that force and distance are inversely proportional to each other. This means simply that as stopping distance becomes shorter, the force becomes greater. Scientists represent this in the following way. Force times distance equals a constant value. So, what's the link between this formula and the examples we saw earlier? How does this formula help us to understand what happens in a real car crash? At the crash test laboratory, new cars are tested as part of a consumer information program called NCAP. The test dummies are fitted with accelerometers, which record the force of the crash at different points on their bodies. They are painted at likely contact points to show where they come into contact with the car. The impact on the car itself is also monitored. Using laser technology, the dummies are precisely aligned so that one model of car can be directly compared with another. The cars are crashed at 56.3 kilometres per hour, an internationally agreed test speed. Yeah. 
Information taken from the tests will be analysed, then published. You can see the dummy's head has contacted here and it's contacted with the steering wheel, deforming it. On the other side, we also have knee contact um, and also the head is contacted the knee from where the seatbelt is stretched. Our whole aim of the program is to get safer vehicles in the long term through publishing the results and making safety sell cars. Modern cars are designed so that the occupant capsule stays intact while the body of the car crumples. This crumpling increases the stopping distance, which reduces the forces on the occupants. Now we'll compare average force and stopping distance represented by the crush in different vehicles. Over a series of new car assessment tests, the overall crush on the vehicle was measured. The average crush for large cars was found to be 0.57 of a metre. The average stopping force on the sandbag is 702 kilograms force. Smaller cars stopped in an average of 0.56 of a metre, a similar distance to the larger cars. The average stopping force on a sandbag would be 710 kilograms force. A van has less bonnet so there's less distance to crush before it crumples into the occupant's space. The average stopping distance of the vans tested was 0.44 of a metre. And the average stopping force on a sandbag would be 910 kilograms force. If we plot the stopping distances on this graph, we can see that the shorter the stopping distance, the greater the force on the occupants. Dummies are also used to test the forces on pedestrians being hit by a car. Some of the car's energy is absorbed by the front bumpers and the sloping bonnet increases the pedestrian stopping distance. However, when a pedestrian is hit by a car fitted with a bull bar, injury is much worse. The bull bar is rigid and does not absorb the energy of impact. The bull bar doesn't crumple, so the person's leg does. Car design can only go so far when it comes to protecting occupants at high speeds. Other safety features are needed to help prevent injury. One of Newton's laws of motion says that a moving body will keep moving unless something forces it to stop. The crash barrier stops the vehicle, but the load keeps travelling until it too is forced to stop. In this case, the force of the load is enough to break through the cabin. If a person is not restrained by a seat belt and the car stops, the same thing happens. The car has stopped, but the person doesn't until something forces them to. The idea of a seat belt is to hold you in place while the car crumples so you slow down at the same rate as the car does. Seat belts are designed to stretch, which increases the stopping distance and reduces the forces on you. However, in a severe crash, even with seat belts holding the body in place, the head can reach the steering wheel or dashboard. This is where airbags come in. In addition to seat belts, modern cars have introduced airbags. Unlike the rigid steering wheel or dashboard, the airbag gives you extra stopping distance, which reduces the forces on you. The design of the airbag gives flexibility, and air escapes through vents, which increases the stopping distance. 
Modern road design also uses the same principle of increasing a car's stopping distance to increase safety. For example, these ends built into roads are designed to absorb energy on impact in a controlled way and to increase stopping distance. Small trees and shrubs are purposely planted to increase a vehicle's stopping distance. If a car runs into the back of a truck, the passengers are at great risk because they are not protected from the tray by a crumple zone. This bumper bar being trialled here is designed to protect cars from this situation. For the front of the truck, this prototype is supported by shock absorbers that absorb energy and increase the stopping distance for the car. This reduces the forces on the occupants. To conclude part one, we've discovered that average force times distance is a constant value. It also is a measure of the work done during the car crash. On the road, this means you need to allow yourself a safe distance to stop. The greater the distance you stop over, the smaller the forces on you as you stop, or if you crash. Before we go to part two, we're going to leave you with a question to think about. If two cars, of equal mass going at equal speed collide head-on, is this any different to a similar car running into a solid wall at the same speed? Now we'll explore the energy of a moving mass, kinetic energy. The faster a car goes, the more energy it has. As the car stops, work is done as kinetic energy is converted to other forms of energy, such as heat, sound and potential energy. In this case, work is done on the car, the barrier, the tyres and the road. Now, here's the answer to that last question. When a car smashes, work is done through an energy change. When two cars collide, there is twice the energy change. But this energy change is shared over two cars. So the effect on each car in the head-on collision is the same as one car running into a barrier at the same speed. Let's look at the effect of speed in a series of controlled crashes. Kinetic energy is proportional to the square of the speed. Kinetic energy also depends on the mass of the car. The greater the mass, the more kinetic energy. We use physics to show that kinetic energy is equal to half the car's mass times the square of the speed. We've already seen that force times distance equals work done. Now let's look at how change in kinetic energy, or change in speed, affects the distance over which we stop. For each of these tests, we'll use the same brake effort and the car will come to a controlled stop. At 25 kilometres per hour, this car took approximately two and a half metres to stop. To test our formula, at double the speed, it should take four times the distance to stop. At three times the speed, it should take nine times the distance to stop. And at four times the speed, it should take 16 times the distance to stop. So let's see what happened in the tests. 
At 50 km per hour, it takes approximately four times the distance to stop. At 75 km per hour, it takes approximately nine times the distance to stop. At 100 km per hour, it should take 16 times the distance to stop. In actual fact, it takes a longer distance to stop because there is less friction acting on the car at high speed. If you would like to follow this up, use this table showing the relationship between speed and the coefficient of friction. Now we'll see the effect of increased speed in a crash. In this series of variable speed tests, the same model car is crashed into the wall at different speeds. The energy is proportional to speed squared. When we compare the crash at 50 km per hour with the crash at double the speed, we can see a dramatic difference. Let's look at this in another way. If you drop a car from a three-storey building, this is the same as crashing it at 50 km per hour. However, if you crash a car at 100 km per hour, it's the same as falling from 12 storeys, twice the speed but four times the height. To recap, we've found that as you go faster, your kinetic energy increases. In order to stop, you need to convert the car's kinetic energy into other forms of energy. This is achieved by applying a stopping force over distance. In part one, we learnt that the average stopping force is inversely proportional to the distance over which the car stops. Simply, this means as the stopping distance decreases, the average force increases. So, to reduce the forces on you in a crash, you need to increase the stopping distance. In part two, we found that kinetic energy is equal to half the mass of the car times the speed squared. So, stopping distance is proportional to the square of the speed. So, to bring these concepts together, we find that the best way to reduce the forces on us is to stop over a longer distance. Which means we need to reduce the speed at which we are driving. The front of a car is designed to crumple, to absorb energy, but it has its limits. At high speeds, the rest of the car will crumple as well. The principles of physics show us that the forces involved in crashing a car at 100 km per hour are the same as the impact forces after falling from a 12-storey building.